welcome to this edition of Case Breakers. I'm your host, uh, Peabody Award-winning former investigative journalist Dale Julin. Joining me today to talk about a fascinating cold case uh, is Jennifer Buchholz. She is a former U.S. Army counterintelligence agent, a decorated veteran of Iraq and Afghanistan, currently uh, holding a, a job as a professor in criminal justice at the American Military University, and she is also on their cold case team. Jen, how you doing? Hey, Dale. Great to see you again. Joining us today is your partner in this case as well. He's George Jarrett, podcast host at Diamond State Murder Board. That's the podcast. He's also an award-winning uh, investigative journalist and true crime aficionado, author of several books. George, thanks for joining us. Nice to meet you, Dale. I'm glad to be here. Glad to have you both. Okay, so as we were joking before the podcast, it's always best to start at the beginning. How did you two come together to go after this particular case, and what was it with this case that made it so intriguing to you? Well, as a lot of viewers know, George and I were presenters last year at what's called CrimeCon, which is short for Crime Conference, and it's the biggest true crime conference in the world, held annually in a different city in the U.S., and George and I were invited to be presenters on the last case that we worked, which was the murder of Rebecca Gould out of Arkansas, who was murdered in 2004. Before we even went to CrimeCon, we had discussed the fact that we were in limbo on Rebecca's case because an arrest had been made, but we were waiting on trial. And there really wasn't a lot for George and I to do on the case anymore, aside from keep the public informed. So we had discussed like wanting to find a new case that we could team up on and help another victim's family on. And we had said, let's see if we, let's see what happens at CrimeCon because a lot of victims' family members go there looking for assistance on their loved one's case. And sure enough, a, uh, I guess I can call her a, another pseudo member, behind the scenes member of our investigative team, Miranda, met a woman named Liz Flat. George and I came to find out we met Liz and heard her story about her sister, Debbie, who was stabbed to death in 1975. And the case is still Debbie unsolved. Debbie Williamson, Love, Love That's Texas, correct. 1975. Yes. And uh, so George, what do you remember about when we first talked about her case? What were your feelings? Well, you know, we had about three or four that we were vetting. Like you said, we had a lot of families approach us and gave us, you know, they would give us, you know, booklets of information with facts about their case. And you and I kind of established a criteria as far as, uh, you know, if we were going to take on another case, you know, one was a family buy-in. So we needed a, a case where the family was bought into. The second thing was, did we have um, access to contemporaneous reports and documents you know, information about the case because, you know, uh, Debbie was, was murdered on August 24th, 1975. So that's a long time. It was, you know, at that time, 45 years, it's now 46. And so those were two things we needed um, for sure. And then the third thing, you know, was, um, was it solvable? Did Could we look at this case independently and was it possible to solve it? Were we going to, and I hate to use the term, but were we going to be wasting valuable time when we could maybe assist someone else on another case that was more solvable and you and i looked at it we spent about two weeks going back and forth and you know um ironically enough i was born in lubbock i didn't grow up there i grew up on the west coast but i was born in lubbock my family's there and debbie actually is buried in the same cemetery as my grandparents and it's uh -huh. not a huge cemetery and uh, we had no idea when we started this process that all that all that was going to happen and it turned out you know um debbie left a widow um, Doug, her husband that she'd been married to for 10 weeks, and he actually moved 10 plus hours away to a town he'd really never been to, to go to college. And it just so happened I worked at the newspaper in that town for eight years. And so Doug actually lived within a couple hours of me. So it was just like every time we turned around, it just looked like the chips were falling in the right place. So, you know, yeah, in George, late June, I think, yes. I'm just saying that's a series of ironic twists. It becomes personal for you. Yeah, well, it, actually, if we had time to go through all the other smaller <laughs> ironies about you, it's it's there's just more. simply unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, there's actually yeah. more, but those are just kind of the big ones. Um, but yeah, we started talking about it, and um, you know, we talked to Liz. We had a we had a conference call with Liz. I think it lasted four hours, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And um, we decided to take the plunge, and you know, like mid to late June of of last year, and that you know, 
uh, you know, we started off by create compiling a list of people that we needed to get a hold of and talk to. Debbie was killed in the carport of her own home at around 930 that night after she had gone and eaten dinner with her mom and dad and sister at a pizza inn in Lubbock. Doug, her husband, was the manager of the pizza inn and he was working that night. He had a, a, a friend of his and a friend of Debbie's, Paul Neal. He was the cook that night. There was a waitress named Marianne who was working. And uh, they also had a friend, another mutual friend named Lex Brown, who was going to come to the Pizza Inn later that night to help them do inventory. Sometime after eight o'clock, Debbie and her family leave. They drop her back at her house. Her mom um, goes into the house for just a moment to look at her wedding dress. It had just come back from the cleaner, so her mom wanted to look at it. Liz was eight at the time, and she wanted to stay the night with Debbie, but she couldn't because we, we theorized it was a school night, and Liz isn't really sure. She just thinks her mom you know, decided she didn't want her to stay the night, but it probably was a school night. That would make sense. And then they leave, and with Within probably an hour, you know, Debbie was supposed to leave her home that night and go back to the Pizza Inn to put some money back in the register that her husband had borrowed to buy a CB radio earlier in the week, kind of like an IOU thing. She was supposed to leave 9 30, 10 o'clock. She obviously never arrives. Around one o'clock, Doug calls repeatedly, calls her parents, calls the house, can't find her. He leaves the Pizza Inn around one o'clock in the morning just to check on her because he still had to do inventory. He goes to the house. Uh, it's dark, but there's light illuminating from the kitchen light that was on. And in the darkness, he finds his, uh, you know, his 18-year-old wife, who had been married to for 10 weeks, stabbed 17 times. Um, her her clothing had been pushed up and pushed down to reveal her her sexual organs. And uh, but she wasn't sexually assaulted that we know of. And so, um, just a really heinous case. And he went back to the Pizza Inn and called the police and then her parents show up and that's when the whole process um, towards trying to find her killer started. Just to reinforce that, uh, the husband had an alibi. Yes. Yes. Paul dated Debbie prior to Doug and him and Doug were good friends. They'd been friends for like five years at this point. And so okay. Paul had a date with a woman named Tina and he asked off early. So the only two people in, in the Pizza Inn restaurant that night, it was a Sunday night, were Doug and Marianne, well, they had an unusual rush of customers, so there was literally no way that Doug could have left. Like, he had to cook and run the register. In fact, he was supposed to do a deposit that night, and because he couldn't leave the restaurant, he couldn't make the deposit. And we actually interviewed Marianne. She contacted us, and she said unequivocally that Doug was there the entire time and that he never left, and she said he couldn't have left. I could not have run the whole restaurant by myself, and we were slammed. And so... His alibi, as far as where he was at at the time of the murder, is pretty solid. Yeah, and please again, confirm um, that that bank deposit was not made that night. They found the envelope with the money and the cash was just registered the, ne the next day, so that also backed up his alibi of not having left the restaurant at all that evening. <laughs> wanna, so, and some, I that? remember... A couple of well, other things, just, too. He, he was polygraphed mm -hmm. twice. And he passed both. Uh, he was questioned extensively by the police. I mean, I think it's virtually impossible at this point to, to say that he was directly involved, like directly connected to the actual killing. Okay, in case you're just joining us, just picking up this podcast, we're talking about the unsolved cold case from 1975 in Lubbock, Texas of Debbie Sue Williamson. Remains unsolved. Jennifer Buchholz and George Jarrett are on the case, so to speak, in more ways than one. Uh, Jen, your expertise is in forensics. Take me as kindly as you can in the tragic situation around the body and the crime scene. Sure. I will say what, what something that really piqued my interest about this crime, <clears throat> some of the behavioral aspects exhibited by the killer, namely that Debbie's body had been moved from the location where she f was attacked and fell to the ground mm. and like she was dragged from the carport about 25 feet to the back step of her own home um and although it, the back step was not well lit it was the most well lit location on the entire property so the killer for some reason wanted to put her in a well again not very well lit but in the most well lit area and then he was showcasing the car on. in a way Yes, um, like putting her on display in a form of humiliation is most likely what it was. And, but going to the actual forensics, um, so you, you mentioned Debbie had been stabbed 17 times. A majority of those stab wounds were to her backside. They, the stab wounds penetrated both of her lungs and her heart. So um, she was up against some major, major medical 
crises within a matter of probably seconds um, of the attack beginning. And what happened was pathologically, her both of her lungs collapsed, which in itself causes a problem because instead of the air being on the inside of your lung, like it's supposed to be the air is on the outside creating pressure and collapsing your lung and making it difficult to breathe. But on top of that, because of the punctures to her lungs, they filled with blood. So she basically drowned. And then the two wounds to her heart um, created an immense amount of pressure on her heart. And within a couple minutes, her heart probably stopped beating. It's a horrendous death. It, all indications are that her killer was in a absolute rage at her for some reason. And we're still, of course, trying to work out what the motive was. But anyways, pathologically, that's, that's how she died. She did have a couple of slash wounds to her scalp, one to the back rear right and one to the right side. And then she did have a slash mark to her right cheek. We're not exactly sure yet how those were inflicted or from what angle, but that's something that we're working to recreate is exactly how each wound was delivered to her. Um, so that's some of the basic forensics about her injuries. Okay. George, take us back to 1975. Lubbock police investigating this, of course, the local authorities, other authorities perhaps investigating this. How far were they able to take it then? How far are they taking it now with your help? Well, back in 1975, you know, they interviewed everybody who was, uh, you know, some of the people that we've just talked about that was directly connected to the case. They interviewed Doug several times. They interviewed her parents. Uh, they interviewed Paul Neal three or four times. They interviewed Lex Brown. And um, they also interviewed her brother, Ricky. She had an older brother who was, um, I guess the the best way to say it is he was troubled. He'd had some, he gotten in trouble for some drug use and he had had some other, I guess, you know, maybe minor criminal activity. So they kind of honed in on him as a, as a suspect from the beginning because they mm. felt like the person who did this, it was a personal crime and it was something you know, and Jennifer and I have been to this house, uh, you know, on the anniversary of the very night that she was murdered. And it even to this day with a five lane highway in front of it now. And back then it was a two lane highway with no houses around virtually. Now there's buildings and there's commercial activity. I mean, there's streetlights everywhere. It was really, really dark. And so uh, Jennifer and I, you know, we immediately you know, said, hey, this has got to be someone who knew this property. And so the feeling was mm -hmm. with the Lubbock PD in 1975 is that maybe the brother could have had something to do with it. You know, Jennifer and I, we, we've looked into that and we're not dismissing anybody at this point. But to this point, we really can't see, we haven't been able to find any connection. And we asked Liz, we're like, because Liz and her mom and dad were repeatedly told that Ricky was a viable suspect in the case, but they really didn't explain why. And so at this point, we're trying to figure that out because we haven't seen anything in the contemporaneous reports. You know, we went back and read some of the newspaper articles that came out at the time. And Dale, you know, as a longtime journalist, you know, sometimes there's little clues or details in the first few hours or first few days of the reporting that comes out because sometimes the police will slip up, give a detail that they're not supposed to. And we actually found oh, yes. some of that. And um, yeah, so it, it didn't lead to Ricky if, as of right now, um, but they interviewed everybody. And then the case after about 1976 kind of went cold. And it reinvigorated in the er, like the mid 1980s when Henry Lee Lucas, the notor notorious not serial killer, you know, he confessed to like 600 murders that went across the country, and some of it was just absolutely ludicrous. I mean, some people should be, really be ashamed and embarrassed by some of the stuff that they were believing that this guy was saying. And he confessed to Debbie's mm -hmm. murder and a couple of other murders in the Lubbock area. Well, her parents were not having any of that. They said, no, there's no way he did this. He didn't get any of the facts of the case right. And so they spent a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of energy proving that Henry Lee Lucas was lying about this. And it turned out that he was lying and he eventually recanted his um, confession in Debbie's case. Now I'll say this, you know, we're, we're working really well with the Lubbock Police Department at this time. And so we're trying to keep those lines of communication up. But I think even they would admit that probably after about 1985, when the Henry Lee Lucas fiasco was finally coming to a close, um, that they really didn't do much in, in, in the way of solving her case after that until probably 2017-ish when Liz really started ramping up the pressure because that Netflix series, The Confession Killer, came out. And I guess it just reignited something in the family about, you know, that they really need to get this case solved. And so from that point on, from 2017 on, she consistently met with Lubbock PD but still wasn't getting quite the results that she wanted or needed. It wasn't progressing. 
And so in probably at Jen, I'd say probably July-ish, early July, we made the decision that we were going to go to Lubbock for at least a week. Mm -hmm. And we were going to track down every single person who um, gave original statements to police. We were going to track down people that we thought should be people of interest. And I don't mean people who committed the crime, but people who may have information that may help solve the crime. And so we compiled a, a list of, I don't know, about 30 or so people that we wanted to track down. And so we went to Lubbock and we decided we were going to be there the night of um, when the, the anniversary of the night of the murder, because we wanted to, you know, you want to be on the ground. Jennifer wanted to take measurements. She wanted to see the, the back step. She wanted to see how close it was to the carport. She wanted to see how the fence line ran, the alley behind the, the, the house. You know, they had found a tire track back there that could possibly be a piece of information or evidence involved in the case. So we wanted to do all that stuff. Plus, we just wanted to look people straight in the face. You know, it's one thing to call them on the phone, which we, we did a lot of that. And we interviewed her, you know, her widowed husband. He's a retired teacher living in Donovan, Missouri. And um, so leading into it, we kind of knew the players who we needed to track down. And remarkably, we were able to track down most of the people we were looking for. And I mean, we were driving down trails in the West Texas desert, with tumbleweeds going by. I mean, cows in the road. I mean, <laughs> I remember one time we were going to talk to the woman that uh, Paul Neal had gone on a date with in her house. I mean, there were like oil jacks bobbing up and yeah. down, one eye as far as the eye could see. And I looked at her and I said, what, are you sure we're they? on the right well, way? And, well, I'm sorry. You know, is, that, is, that is that Texas talk, Georgia? I don't know. What was, what was <laughs> as far as the eye could see? As far as the eye could see. And listen, Dale, if you ever want to go to West Texas, you'll see it and go, that's exactly what George was talking about. <laughs> yeah. And we're in George's Mustang. <laughs> Sports car. Yeah, we were in like my convertible Mustang and we were driving down this. And I, when I say the word gravel road, I'm being very, very generous because this was like a trail that horses would ride down. And, uh, right. and you know, and what was interesting, Dale, is that a lot of people that we were going to go and interview and talk to, they had no idea we were going to show up at their house. The woman that went on the date with Paul Neal that night. Um, you know, because that's his alibi for the night of, uh, uh, of the, of the murder. So, you know, you want to check check with those people just to cross all your T's and dot your I's. We showed up at her house. She had no, she was making lunch for her husband. She had no idea. We knocked on the door or not knocked on the door. The husband came out and asked us what we wanted. And we said, we need to talk to Tina. And they invited us into their home. And we sat and talked to her for hours in a, you know, they have a beautiful house and it's literally in the middle of nowhere. Like you can look and there's no, they have no neighbors. It's all Nothing. desert out there. And, right. you know, we just kind of did that same pattern everywhere we went. It was really, really astonishing. And it was actually a, a, a refreshing for sure. We will get back to our program, our podcast in just a moment. But first, if you'd like to get involved personally, if you'd like to join the team, perhaps, if you have some details about maybe this case or another case you'd like to share with us, please contact Case Breakers. If you'd like to make a donation, just a reminder, we're a nonprofit organization and we're all volunteering our time here to try to get these cases closed because we think it's important and we know if you're watching this program, as you are, you think they're important too. So please, if you have any of that that you'd like to share with us, if you'd like to join the team in one way or the other or make a donation, please go to the link below. Jen, fingerprints, the blood everywhere, the footprints, what, you know, this guy, probably a guy. Have you, have you eliminated mm -hmm. women in this case? I mean, not 100%, but most, most of the evidence points in the direction of a okay. male. Finger, fingerprints, and years later, DNA, what's up with all that? Sure, so uh, there was actually a lot of evidence collected from the scene, which is fantastic. Uh, Debbie, All of Debbie's clothing, of course, was submitted as evidence. They printed the scene inside and out the house. They collected item, potential items of evidence from inside and outside, and all those were submitted to the lab. But as viewers know, back in 1970, the only DNA analysis that existed was blood typing. So all they could do was determine some of the uh, blood type uh, in the pool of blood and it matched Debbie's, so obviously it was her blood. Um, but now we have a lot of new technology and some of that evidence has already or is in route or has already been received by a accredited you know, cutting edge DNA lab for retesting. Um, that process does take a little while, probably several weeks or even a couple months, but we're hopeful that with new technology, 
maybe the killer's DNA can be found on Debbie's clothing or some of those other items of evidence. And I mean, the answer could be right there. So we're and Lubbock PD is in the process of retesting evidence. We know that for a fact. And the murder weapon. Don't know. Um, that's one of the things missing from the scene along with Debbie's purse. The killer took the weapon with them. It's never been found. We have interviewed a knife expert who we're actually going to have another session with in the near future, but he believes the most likely type of knife used was a double-edged blade, which is not overly common. He thinks it was a fixed blade, meaning it would not retract into the hand like a switchblade would. He believes the knife probably had a decent sized hilt on it, um, protecting the killer's hand from getting sliced, and that it was probably a fairly high quality dagger style knife that was used to stab her. So that that's actually really helpful information. You know, if you can narrow down the style of weapon, then, then that can give us some clues about the killer as well. Yeah, to that note, George, motive, right? A, a, a particular kind of murder weapon, meaning he brought it with him, right? He had yes. he had uh, some sort of motive. Uh, George, who hated Debbie Sue Williamson and why? Well, that's an interesting question, Dale, because we have, and, and I, I say this, in, in, and this is just a reality. I've, I've covered a lot of murder cases through the years. And, you know, when you're covering a murder case and you're writing about it, you get to know the family, you're in, involved in the investigation, you kind of get to peer into the, the soul of the person who was lost. And sometimes they're always not, I hate to say it, there are not always the nicest of people. You know, you find things out about these murder victims. Yes. And um, the, one of the astonishing things about Debbie's case is we have found absolutely not one scintilla of comment or evidence. Everybody seemed to genuinely like and love her. She was just a very warm, sweet person who we've got letters that she wrote her dad, you know, after she got married. It's really hard to imagine who would have wanted to do this. Now, that being said, the FBI statistics on this are pretty clear. Likely, almost always, the most likely suspect is a lover or a love interest. Obviously, the first person you're going to vet in that scenario is Doug because they've been married for 10 weeks. Everything from the contemporaneous police reports to every scintilla of information that we were able to dig up. And there was no strife between Doug and Debbie that we've ever been able to uncover. In fact, Doug went and lived with her parents. The house that they moved into was the house that Doug had grown up in. His parents had given them the house after they got married because they had already, they had either built or bought another house. So they were leaving that house. They owned it. So they just gave it to them. So this was a house that really? Doug and all of his we're very familiar with, yes. Ricky was a person of interest. We understand why he was someone that they would look at. You know, Paul Neal was vetted uh, quite a bit because he had dated her previously and he wasn't invited to their wedding, which was kind of odd because he was still friends with Debbie. He was really good friends with Doug. And in fact, he actually served as a pallbearer at her funeral. So it's kind of interesting that he wasn't invited to the wedding, but he served as a pallbearer. Uh, Lex Brown, another friend of theirs, they worked together at a McDonald's before Doug had worked at the Pizza Inn. He was a manager at a McDonald's before that. Paul, Lex, Debbie, and Doug all worked there. And, you know, so Lex was somebody that they, you know, wanted to talk to and get information from. Uh, they also talked to uh, Doug's ex-girlfriend, Susan, who she had dated Doug before that. And we actually tracked Susan down and talked to her. And uh, she understood why she would be a suspect initially because, you know, her and Doug had been engaged before he got with Debbie. And even to this day, she obviously thinks very highly of Doug and they had a, a long-term relationship. So, uh, she would have to be looked at. Um, basically, this, we don't know who killed Deborah Sue Williamson, but we do know this. Whoever killed her had to have cardinal knowledge of that yard and the home. They had to know the layout. They had to know the yard. It has to be precise. This is a very unique house and yard. I'm telling you, if you go there, you'll understand. Like we, we thought we understood, but we really understand now. And it also has to be someone who could take a military gray, military style dagger, because that's what our knife expert thinks, is that this was like a military style dagger that possibly was produced during World War II, like from 1943 to 1945. There were several million of these type of daggers. He actually came to my house and showed me how the killer could have held this very lengthy dagger along the inside of his arm. And when he put that dagger in that position, I couldn't see it. I had no idea it was there. And then the killer turns like this and the daggers in this ice pick position. And a lot of the wounds and Jennifer can speak to this better than I, a lot of the wounds look like they were delivered from this ice pick um, position. My podcast producer said it best. He said, I'm looking at a knife because the 
my uh, knife expert brought a knife similar. And he said, that is a knife that's only used for one thing and that's killing humans. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. And I um, want to say one more thing about the motive. If this was a stranger homicide, they wouldn't have taken the time to drag her body and partially disrobe her because both those actions are actually pretty difficult. If this was just a robbery gone wrong or something, they would have just grabbed her purse and ran. This person had a, a per, you know, a personal connection, a direct connection to Debbie. And we know that mm -hmm. just based on the actions they took at the scene that were completely unnecessary necessary in order to complete the crime. Dale, one thing you, you said about the um, about her being like um, displayed, she was displayed on that st or near the step. What our belief is, is that the killer was displaying her for Doug to find her, that he would get out of his car because he didn't even see her when he pulled up that night. He did not see her when his car pulled up. He actually was stumbling through the darkness and came upon her body. He, he knows the kitchen door is open but he didn't notice anything else. So our belief is, is that the killer actually dragged her back to that spot so that she could be posed for Doug. So the person was telling, you know, they were like insinuating, hey, this is what you used to have and now you don't have this anymore. Yeah, I took it from you, yeah. So Jen and then George here, as we uh, uh, wrap things up, I'm gonna ask you, of course, to let our viewers know what they can do and who they can contact. But first, sum up if you would, you Jen then, and you George, it's happened before to you, Jen, and company, right? That the uh, actual alleged killer starts trolling the internet to see what's up on their crime and looks yes. on Facebook pages and comes to this podcast. You know, it is called Case Breakers after all. And that uh, killer, likely he, is still out there. Well, very likely, in the sense of guilt, be watching this show right now. What should they be concerned about? Given what you know about the case, you first, Jen. Well, first of all, what they should be concerned about is what we've never publicized, which is a lot. So don't think that everything that George and I discuss publicly on a podcast is everything that we know, because it's probably about 20% of what we actually know. And yes, we've talked about some of the people publicly that we've gotten a hold of, but rest assured there are dozens more behind the scenes who we've talked to. And we've got, we're nearing 900 members on our Facebook group, by the way, which is titled Unsolved Murder of Deborah Sue Williamson. And we urge anybody who wants to help us to join the group. But we've got nearly 900 members on there, a lot of them in the Lubbock area, and a lot of them doing poking around for us behind the scenes and helping us with, you know, the private side of our investigation. You know, you can troll us all you want. You can watch, watch our Facebook group and all our presentations, but rest assured that we know a lot more than you think that we know. If you look at our track record, George and I do not give up until we get some resolution in a case. So don't think that this is ever going away. George, your thoughts? Well, you know, when we started this process with Deborah Sue Williamson's uh, case, you know, I'm an old style journalist. So uh, there's some old style techniques that, you know, I still think work pretty effectively. You know, we live in a CSI world now where it's all about DNA and cell phone tracking and all this other stuff. I don't believe that somebody could have killed her, could have been silent for 46 years. One of the things that we hope to do with our Facebook page and with our other, you know, our outreach efforts through podcasting, through um, the case breakers, um, through the, all these different um, avenues that we're using, we're trying to create as big a net as we can so we can capture that person and that they will come and talk to us. Quite literally, that has happened to Jennifer and I in the first case we worked together. It's happened to me in other cases I've worked in previous years. You know, you just keep pounding and then finally something breaks. You get a, an anonymous email, an anonymous phone call, something happens, and then the next thing you know, the whole world is changing in that case. We're hopeful that that'll happen really soon. I mean, I would love to go to Las Vegas in April or early May to talk about this case being solved, as opposed yes. to us continuing to investigate it. If that person is listening, please just contact us. We'll make sure we will funnel you to the right person at the Lubbock Police Department. You, Your confidentiality will be protected. We have a very yes. solid track record with that. Like Jennifer said, I mean, she said 20% of what we know. I, I I thought she was being generous. I don't know that it's even been 20% of what it we, might not be. <laughs> of the, we know. So, um, but just know this, and if the killer's out there listening, is that, you know, we're not going to stop. So maybe you need to just turn yourself in. I mean, that would be a good, that would be a good resolution to this case as well. Yeah. After all these years, if the killer decided, I got to get this rock off my back, this terrible pain and anguish, now would be a good time because, uh, yeah. you know, prosecutors in cases like this, 
can be a little more lenient with the passage of time. Agree or disagree, Jen? That's 100% Absolutely. true. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and um, Lubbock PD is spending an exorbitant amount of money to have all this evidence retested, to put new detectives on it. If there's a lot of manpower. You know, George and I obviously, you know, there, there's no money making involved from our end, but I mean, we've put in, between the two of us, over thousands of hours and everybody else who's helping us. So if someone would like to just walk into the police department and fess up at this point, I can almost guarantee the DA will go a little lighter on you than if you're gonna wait around for, you know, dozens or more people to find you out, they're gonna throw the book at you. I mean, pretty much guaranteed for what you're putting all of these people through and basically wasting the time, resources, and money of the Lubbock Police Department. And Dale, I would add, yes, go ahead. Dale, I would add this. Um, when, it, when it comes to the murder of Deborah Sue Williamson, I think people need to understand, we hear the term stabbing a lot. You know, a lot of people get stabbed. It's very rare, actually, for somebody to get stabbed to death. That's actually kind of a rarer crime, and it's a very personal crime. The person did not slash her throat. They did not, um, they didn't even bring a gun to shoot her and kill her. This person was absolutely in an uncontrollable rage. And when you kill somebody in that close proximity, her, her last breaths, like her body breathing in and out the last ones, this person felt that against their body. And the, her, her blood was all over them. And, you know, quite literally, I don't think I can emphasize enough how intimate it is when you take a knife and shove it through somebody's heart and through their lungs. So this person was very close to her, was very obsessed with her. And so I think that we need to remember that when we're looking at potential suspects. And so we are, and so you are, and so is Lubbock Police. And if uh, the killer is watching right now, really think about it. This would be a good time to turn yourself in because these guys are coming for you. Thank you, Jennifer Buchholz and George Jarrett yes. for joining us on this edition of Case Breakers. My name's Dale Julin. As always, take care.